Praise God. We're continuing on with our final installation of the Ask the Pastor series. You guys submitted questions in a box uh, early this summer, late spring, and we have gone through them all summer. And these are the final questions. There's, there's three questions we're going to deal with today. Um, why did Satan turn his back on God? Christians and gun control. That was very interesting. Uh, we'll at least take a look at what the Bible may have to say close to that. And then, how did Noah fit all the animals on the ark? That is a very good question. So, let's take a look at the Bible today and take a look at some stuff here. Number one, why did Satan turn his back on God? Well, if he knows he is being defeated, why is he still fighting? Was another way the question was worded. Well, number one is pride. Pride is the reason the Bible tells us that he fell in the first place. Satan's role before the fall and the desire for God's glory was there. He was steward over the throne room, over the throne of God in essence, and, and oversaw the glory and the power that was being received by God and desired that for himself. The Bible says that he was consumed with pride. And, and, and so pride is a big thing. Pride is something that we must be cautious of. It was uh, evidence that the fall, it's been evidenced all throughout scripture illustration. Pride is, is a big problem. Webster says pride is a conceited sense of one's superiority. And we can certainly see that in context of scripture as well. Proverbs 13.10 tells us pride only breeds quarrels, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. So pride, in essence, is the sole source of contention. Anytime there's contention or strife or struggle, pride is at its very core. Even in the smallest of arguments, Pride is at the center of the sin. Someone is consumed with pride, there is a problem, there is contention. The Bible makes it very clear. Um, pride does a lot of things. I'm going to mention a few of them real quickly. <clears throat> pride hardens our heart toward God. <clears throat> the Bible tells us about King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 5 and verse 20 that his heart became arrogant and it became hardened with pride. And he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory and his this kind of mindset that the atheist is born in Proverbs 14, 1, it says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. In other words, God believes in you, but God doesn't believe in atheists either. And kind of an oxymoron, kind of a funny thing there. But um, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the Bible says, came, became so proud in his heart here, in the attitude of his heart, that it actually caused him, God for him to strip him from his throne. And this is exactly the same thing that happened with Satan. The Bible says he was consumed with pride, thinking he could be God. Hosea chapter 7 and verse 9 and 10 says, speaks of pride sucking the life out of Ephraim, which Ephraim means double fruit. It means that the pride literally sucked the, the, the life right out of Ephraim without them even realizing it. So pride is a damning thing. It's a damaging thing when we're filled with pride. Another thing that pride does, it hardens our heart toward God, but it also hinders our spiritual growth. Proverbs 26 and 12, the Bible says, do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. It hinders us from, from coming to God, and that's really uh, a problem. When we can't come to God, it means we're so consumed with pride that there is literally, as the Bible says, no hope for us. Psalm chapter 10 and verse 4, Scripture says, In his pride the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are there, but there is no room for God. In other words, a prideful person, all their thoughts are about them. All their thoughts are about what they can receive and what they can do. I mean, how many have been a teenager? How many are teenagers? Okay, uh, when I was a teenager, and even since then, especially these days, I struggle with it as well, but pride is a big enemy. It likes to come in and sneak in and, and make you think you're better than you really are. When someone uh, uh, questions your work ethic or, or your abilities somehow or something, and all of a sudden uh, that, that raises up within you an argument, maybe uh, that sent, rise up. Maybe there's a little bit of element of truth in every criticism. We know this for sure. As we looked at, we saw this just a couple weeks ago in here. But, but the fact of the matter is, when we're offended, that pride likes to really come out and likes to raise up its ugly head. Pride uh, causes us as well to deceive ourselves. I'm sure you've heard it said that if you tell yourself a lie long enough, after a while you'll believe that it's true. And, and the Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter 49 and verse 16 
um, that they had built uh, houses for them, homes way up in the cleft of the rocks, and, and all because they thought they were safe then. But the Bible says calamity came on them anyway. Um, when we get to a place where we, we think that we've got it made or we're in the clear, you know, those are some of the most dangerous places to be. We've always got to be humble before God. And finally, it leads to ruin. It leads to ruin. Proverbs 16, verse 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be lowly in spirit and among the oppressed than to share the plunder with the proud. You know, there's some reasons. It's very interesting that first of all, Satan is, was filled with pride and it caused him to be deposed of his throne. Even now he's fighting because of that sense of superiority. But why is he still fighting? Well, there's some reasons for that. A couple of them I want to give you. Num this, the next one is he knows that if he can stop the church from praying, he has won. In other words, Satan can wipe out, if he can wipe out the spiritual fervor of a church to seek God for souls and are eager to, to win souls for Jesus and to serve Jesus till his return, in his mind, he is one. He's taken away his greatest foe in this world. The Bible says that he that, that letteth will let no more. In other words, that the work of the Holy Spirit and in, in through the church one day is going to be taken out of this world. And, and there's not going to be a resistance through the praying church. And if he can get you and I, friends, to stop praying, he has won. Another reason he's still fighting is because he knows the clock is ticking. Romans chapter 11 and verse 25 says, until the whole number of Gentiles comes in. We did this in the Revelation series, but in essence, there's a clicker count. Every time someone comes to Christ in heaven, there's a, there's a clicker and there's a number, apparently, that God has set for the full number of people that are not of Jewish uh, uh, ancestry and tradition that are now spiritual Jews by nature, that, that God is waiting for the full number of Gentiles to come in, that there's a, there's a reader board, if you will, in heaven, if you can put it that way, that, that is numbering every time someone comes to Christ, and, and that number is growing and growing and growing, and when it gets to a certain point, then God says, hey, I'm done, I'm ready, uh, let's sound the trumpet, go ahead and blow it, it's time for them to come on home, and that's good news. But Satan doesn't like that. The Bible says he knows that there's a counting going on, and he's just waiting for that to end. So pride is that biggest thing. The Bible tells us that why he fell, why he rebels against God, is because of pride. So we need to be on guard in our own lives against pride. Pride resists authorities, the natural authorities that God has put in our lives to lead us and guide us in this world. And we ought to be careful to trust God's providence in our life. Now, not all authorities are good. How many know this? Not all authorities are good. Some of them are just... They're bad. They maybe have a mean boss at work, right? But friend, God still put that authority in your life for a reason. As much as you and I may not like it, God has his glory yet to be revealed through your situation and mine as well. That's just the way that he works. The next question was asked was, what about Christians and gun control? So I was wondering if it was about Christians and gun control or gun control and Christians or, or what the two had to go together. I wasn't sure. But there's a couple of scriptures I want to bring to bear. First of all, kind of about the idea of of um, Matthew chapter 26, verse 52 reveals to us. It says, Jesus tells Peter, those that live by the sword will die by the sword. So if you take that in that context, you say, well, then that's not really a very good thing for people who like to tote guns. But Luke chapter 11, verse 21, scripture says, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own play palace, his goods are safe. But when one who is stronger than he attacks and overcomes him. He will take away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. I would say, according to Scripture, in every instance we find an illustration. Um, the Bible tells us that they defended when they were attacked. So it's okay to defend. Um, Blackstone's commentary in the United States um, was, the, was the standard for lawyers in our nation to be trained from. Up until about 40 years ago, it was the, it was the bearer of truth. And it got its principles directly from the Bible. And Blackstone's commentary actually reads in Ameri of course America, where there is no direct biblical principle given, government shall make its own law. So when government makes its own law, the Bible tells us as believers that we are to respect those who are in authority over us. That should make it pretty clear. So hopefully between Luke 11, 21 and, and exactly what the Bible says about us being an obedient to those who are in authority that that we understand that, that it's okay to protect yourself. I believe in this uh, right that is given to American citizens, and we should defend that right. It's the, the reason the Second Amendment is there. 
and uh, because it was it was supposed to be for the purpose of uh, initially anyway for for citizens to defend themselves and it is still there to this day so anyway very interesting questions that's what I had to say about them good night God bless you uh, <laughs> How did they, how did they know if it all the animals? Well, how much time do we got here? Let's see. It's about twenty after. Um, first of all, number one, the ark was big. Genesis chapter six, verse fifteen. Scripture says, "This is how you shall make it: the length of it about three hundred cubits, its breadth fifty cubits, and its height thirty cubits. Make a roof of the ark and finish it to a cubit above, and set a door of the ark on its uh, the the ark." in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. So, if we use the nipper cubit, which is commonly used, 20.4 inches is a cubit. It works out to be about 1.7 feet per cubit. So, making the ark about 510 feet long. That's a little bigger than one and a half football fields, okay, in length. So let's visualize this thing how I, by actually comparing it to items that we're familiar seeing today. The, ar the ark was twice as long as an early Boeing 747 airliner. It would take nearly, like I said, one and a half football fields to equal its length. Part of the answer to the question is the fact the ark was huge. It was big enough to hold the contents of more than 450 semi-trailers. And that's a lot of space. 62 smart cars, bumper to bumper, would stretch from bow to stern. So that's a lot of smart cars. Um, NASA could lay three space shuttles, nose to tail, on the Ark's deck, okay? About 500 foot long, 83 feet wide. Let me put this in perspective. Each deck would be 41,500 square feet. Now, this building is only... Uh, 50 feet from the air conditioner all the way over here to Brandon's guitar. So from wall to wall, we have 50 feet. We've got about 200 chairs in our sanctuary, and the whole church property is only 200 feet of street front from the pole out here all the way to the edge of the parking lot where I saw someone park the semi-truck this morning. So all the way to the edge of the parking lot to this pole is 200 feet, and the whole church property is about 80 feet wide. So you have this width of the entire church property being the width of the ark, and the church property length double plus that way. Okay? Three decks high. So if you add all the decks together, 41,500 square feet, there would be three decks a total. There would be about 124,500 square feet which is comparable to your modern-day Costco. So, now, if we take a look at other big ships, this is the Leo Ferna, which was built centuries after the Ark, but yet it was built in 280 B.C., along with many other ships. Um, one account from a man called Usher's description of a battle, he talked about this ship that was built. It had... Um, it was the largest ship of all eight tiers of oars and was called the Leoferna. It was admired by her, for her large size and exquisite construction. In her were a couple, were a hundred oars per tier. In other words, there were a hundred oars per side, and it says here that there were eight men on each oar. So there were 1,600 men rowing the boat, and they had 1,200 men above deck. It was the largest ship of its time, where most ships were between 8 and 10 oars. This one had 100 per side, as uh, is recorded here, and um, I couldn't imagine feeding all those people. But it, it's a depiction of it. It's one depiction of it, obviously. Nobody has a real drawing of the actual ship. The only reason for showing this and along with these other ships, um, many ships, some ships were built. There was two of them that had 50 oars per tier and was over 120 meters long, which is 400 feet long, almost as long as the Ark. Um, it was built in um, 280 B.C. Um, Athenus gives us another detail of a very large ship built by uh, another guy. I don't want to try to pronounce his name. Uh, 244 to 205 B.C. And it was 130 meters 420 feet long, eight, 57 feet wide, 18 meters wide, and, and 72 
feet high. Uh, the top of this church building is probably 38 feet at the most. Um, so, I mean, if you look at, if you look at the time period, uh, centuries before, obviously, the ark was built before, but the ability in terms of what technology they may have is very possible that this, could, this structure was actually built. Of course it was. The Bible says it was. The minute you get somebody beginning to say that, hey, uh, just pretend the Bible isn't for reals for a second, and try to, and you can't do that. You can never remove the word of God from your argument. You cannot take it out. It is the truth. So this boat was big. It was huge, as wide as our entire church property, more than twice as long as a church property, and it had several. Now, our next picture here, um, can we go to the next one? Um, gives kind of an illustration. I wanted to show that a lot of times what we're hearing today is the fairy tale version of the ark. You've seen pictures of this with giraffe heads coming out the top, barely being able to survive and squeeze. You're thinking, how in the world did all of these animals fit on this boat? And, you know, it rained for 40 days, and then there are months afterwards, they're, they're still floating. So, I mean, that's quite impossible. Um, the reality of it is that it was a large structure. Ark means box. So we don't know if it had a bow or not. It was probably just square. I don't know what it looked like. But nonetheless, that is more reality compared to the fictional accounts that we all heard from Sunday school. And yes, I do blame some of our Sunday school curricula for not building a realistic perspective in children about what kind of uh, structure this was because we ought to be telling the truth to our kids. Amen? Um, another, a few other things is before the flood, the earth was most likely one continent. And scripture tells us, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 22, 20 tells us that Noah didn't have to search or travel very far away to bring all the animals on board. There was probably one continent and the animals simply arrived by God's drawing them, uh, according to scripture, by a homing instinct. Two of every kind, seven of some land animals. So rather than two full-grown sauropods and elephants, giraffes and other large animals, Noah would have brought young animals. He would have brought an um, adolescent, not full-grown. Um, the ark only needed to carry one kind of the animal, not every variety of its species. The ark also didn't need to carry all these kinds, like I said, nor did God command that he did. It only carried the air-breathing, the land-dwelling creatures. And then another great factor reducing the space requirements is the fact that the variety of species that we say that we see today did not exist. If you were in here for the Genesis series and the the, the uh, answers in Genesis series was fantastic. Uh, these scientists have shown how that the variety of species um, have cultivated over just uh, in a in hundred years. The, they're the same kind, but they develop into different species depending on their environments and, and adapt. For example, only two dogs because there's only, uh, well, one dog per family. That's not a good joke, but... Um, we need to see the rise in all the dog species that, that there exists today. There was a predominant dog. So all the animals could have been juvenile as well and not adults to fit on the boat. So it's important to understand that when the word is used in Bible, the kind used in Genesis 1, it seems to represent something closer to the, the family level of classification in most instances. And, and scholars doing the research for this project um, that I'm reading from, uh, that I got the sources from, and I can give you all the sources if you'd like to have them when we're finished today, uh, from their research on living and fossil mammal, amphibian, reptile, and bird, uh, that may have been as few as a thousand land animal kinds represented in the ark, um, and there were two of each kind and seven of some other animals, and somewhere between 2,000 to, 2, to 3,000 actual land animals were needed in the ark. So this number is much smaller than what people have been claiming over the years would have to have been on the ark. So the average size of the ark, we can go on to the, the, uh, the average size of, the of, the, of a dinosaur is about the size of a bison, and they were on the ark. If I can go to my next picture. Here's a rendering uh, model of what somebody uh, built as, as a cross-section of what the, the decks of the ark could have looked like in terms of it having three levels. So we have three levels. We have 120,000 square feet. We have a, a massive structure, wood built. Now, how many have heard the answers in Genesis? Ken Ham, they're building, that have constructed the ark uh, just south of Cincinnati, Ohio. Everybody, you can go online and, and research the ark 
uh, he has built a, a, a life-size, it's the largest wood structure in the world. And they, they, they built it, it's a museum, you can go through, it's an experience, you can walk through, it's, it's quite fascinating. And the Lord sent a pair of each unclean breathing animals into the, into the, the uh, ark for Noah to care for and release into the post-flood world, and dinosaurs fit the description, so they would, they would have been included in the manifest for the ship, they would have had to have been on the boat. So um, how could these enormous creatures fit inside the ark? Um, which included dinosaur kinds that we know of. Job, Job chapter 40 talks about dinosaurs, talks about behemoth on the earth and how he swings his tail, it's like a cedar and all of these things. So we know that dinosaurs were in the Bible and Job is the oldest book in the Bible. So we find many kinds of dinosaurs fossilized in flood sediments and it's most probable that Noah carried juvenile or young animals on the ark and in this way they could all the dinosaurs and everything could fit on the ark and what we know of dinosaurs most are not they're most of them are small from the fossil records that we have uh, most of them are not real big and and what we know of dinosaurs um, as well um, that from what we see in Jurassic Park or other modern day dinosaur movies is, is not realistic so most scientists agree that the average size of a dinosaur was the size of a bison and We've, we've got to consider the size of the dinosaur. Even the ginormous sauropods and the mighty T-Rex started out as eggs the size of a football. So juvenile beasts would not take up that much space on the ark. It's very possible that smaller varieties within the given kind of animal could have fit on the ark. And, and, and so I think we need to estimate how many dinosaur kinds existed, and, and that's really important. Over a thousand dinosaur species have been named, but many belong to the same kind of family. And, and so I don't know how many people were wanting the real specifics, but there were as few as fif between 50 and 90 dinosaur kinds. That, that could have been brought onto the ark. So with all this information, not only was there enough room on the ark, but there was enough room for food storage, there was enough room for living quarters, there was tons of space available if you consider all of the family level or the kinds of animals that could have theoretically, or that were brought on the ark, but uh, according to scientists, theoretically the kinds at the family level definitely fit into the boat. I want to read scripture about the flood here. So if you have your Bibles and want to turn to Genesis chapter 7, we're going to read from verse 11 all the way down through verse 24. But I want to, I want to read this part, and I want to get to the real heart of the matter, because the fact of the matter is that, that God has appointed and set up uh, some, some great truths in his word, and his word can be trusted, amen? And, and we need to be able to trust it. Genesis chapter 7 Verse 11 says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the seventh day of the month, and on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened, and the rain fell on the earth forty days and forty nights. On the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons entered the ark, that they and every beast according to its kind and all the livestock according to their kinds, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh were uh, which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Now read with me from verse 17. The Bible says the flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters, and the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains of the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep, and all the flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind. Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds in the heavens. They were blotted out from the face of the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed in the earth 150 days. So the Bible says, according to scripture, that this was a total global flood, a catastrophe. Now, some of the fantastic things that we hear today um, is that it wasn't a catastrophe. Can I have my next picture? This is kind of what happened according to some idea, that it was only a regional flood, 
that only happened in part of the area, which is total nonsense. Not only does the Bible says it covered the whole earth, but it was, in fact, not just the rain that came down, but the Bible says the, the deep gave up its water. And so water's coming up, water's coming down, water's running everywhere, and it totally destroys everything. How many have ever had a leak in your house? This is something that I do, I, my business does, when there's a leak in somebody's house, the, the dishwasher line, so the, the refrigerator supply line breaks, or the toilet supply line breaks, and you know, and, and you have a, several 40 gallons, up, up to 40 gallons in an hour, pouring out of that little thing. You have a mess, you have a disaster, don't you? And, and what happens is water destroys everything. Now, what we saw just in the, in, in the catastrophe idea is an idea that is fully embraced by creation scientists that not only was the earth subjected to this tremendous flood, but all kinds of catastrophe things were going on with the tectonic plate shifts and, and potentially dividing of continents at this point and, and all kinds of stuff that happened. But it happened in a very short period of time. And how do we know this? Well, s evolutionary scientists will take us to the Great Ca Grand Canyon and they'll say, see all these layers? They represent different years. And so they'll, they'll measure up all of these thousand layers and all these different periods in which they, each layer represents a certain thousands of years. So it, it's billions of years that this has happened. Well, an amazing thing happened around here not too long ago, and that Mount St. Helens blew up. How many remember Mount St. Helens? When I was a kid, I was living in Montana at the time, and, and we got more ash than you guys got here. It just flowed up and over the Cascades and the Rockies and landed right on the, the, uh, the east side of the Rocky Mountains where I was at as, as well as everywhere, and the, it was this thick everywhere. It was inches of the stuff all over our cars, and we were all wearing masks to protect breathing, and, and this, this brown dust was everywhere, right? And it was just a total mess. Well, something fascinating happened when Mount St. Helens blew. It created a perfect 140th scale of the Grand Canyon with all the layers, all the crazy trees buried upside down the way that they were vertical, all of it happened in the matter of just a couple of short months after Mount St. Helens blew, with the mud flows and everything. So um, that seems pretty curious. That didn't take millions of years to happen, and yet all of those layers are evident. So when we look at creation, we look at how God, through catastrophe, can make something happen so amazing in such a short amount of time. It is no doubt that the earth is between eight and 10,000 years old and that God created everything. He created the heavens and the earth. We have the time of the flood, 4, 000, about 4,000 years from then. Now we have all kinds of incredible history related to that. We know how old Adam was when he died. We know everything. If the Bible is wrong about Genesis, and where else is it wrong? Bible is telling the truth from its very first page. A day is a day. A time is a time. It is what it is. The Bible records the earth being subjected to this catastrophe. And there are a lot of other ancient writings and drawings depicting the ark and the flood. For example, in Asia, in China, a Chinese, there's a Chinese classic tale about the family of Fuhi that was saved from a giant flood. In Babylon, Gilgamesh, the, the account of Gilgamesh. You know, when we went to the, to the Gen Genesis series, we, we read some of the uh, accounts of Gilgamesh and his, and his exploits. But he met Noah, who told him about the flood and the building of the ark. The Chaldeans, a legend about Noah and God warning him to build an ark. In India, there's a legend about a man speaking to a fish, telling him that a great flood was coming. In Australia, there's a legend of the flood called the Dreamtime Flood. Riding on this flood was a, was a big boat, uh, the Ark of Guma, Gumana. In Europe, in Greece, there's legends that, that humans became proud and it bothered Zeus. So he decided he was going to destroy all humans and flood the whole earth. And even here in North America, in Mexico, the Toltec natives have a legend saying that all the original creation lasted for 1,760 years, and the earth was destroyed by a flood. One family survived. Wow, that's a pretty close account of the biblical history. And many other legends from the United States, the Abowi Indians, the Delaware Indians, South America, the Incas. Uh, one of the most fascinating finds was the next picture I have up picture of one of the tablets of Nineveh, Nippur, and there's 20,000 of these 
tablets that were discovered. And the library tablets from Nineveh and Nippur was, was an amazing find. And at the time, the significance was, wasn't even known. These are on display at the Royal Library of Ashburn, Nepal in, in Great Britain. But um, decades later, they deciphered many of the tablets and they show a version of the flood account almost identical to what we find in Genesis. And two of the most significant items sharing any commonality to biblical history, even loosely, were the versions of the flood epic and the list of the Sumerian kings. And we, we have this incredible identity, identical to biblical history. You see, the Bible is so trustworthy. We can trust what it says. Now, these documents have a lot of similarities to biblical history, and there's differences in some places, but the Bible holds to its truth. The Bible is a fascinating book. This book that you hold in your hand, no matter the contemporary English version that you may be holding in your hand, this is an NIV, the English Standard Version is a great new one if you're looking for a new one, or, or today, uh, new, new, new uh, century version is a great, there's some great new versions out of, in plain English. The, the Living New Testament is, is um, really good. I don't suggest the today's NIV, the TNIV. It changes the genderness of God to gender neutral. So the TNIV, do not go there. The old NIV, sure. But, you know, uh, for the most part, you can take every new trustworthy, trusted English version of the Bible, and you can count on it, friends. You can just count on it. Even the King James has areas where it's a little bit chicken. Uh-oh, don't throw stones at me. But we have this book in our hands and we hold on to it. And, and, and even though a translator may have gotten a few things wrong, it's, it's a remarkable book. This is what's so fascinating about this book. No other book has been proven archaeologically more than the Bible. It agrees with itself theologically, scientifically, and logically. There are more writings about this book than any other book there is in history. The entire New Testament can be reconstructed by just the writings, the, the, the commentary of the early church fathers. The entire New Testament can be constructed just by their writings alone, except for 11 verses. There has never been a, more, a book that's more scrutinized than this book. When the Dead Sea Scrolls came around uh, and we discovered them, they contain at least fragments of every book of the Old Testament. And of the 166 words in Isaiah 53 of the Dead Sea Scrolls, there are 17 letters that are a little different. 17 letters. They don't change the context. They don't change the history. They don't change the theology or nothing about that. They're just grammatical issues. It has 66 individual books by more than 30 people, written by more than 30 people, including a tax collector, a sheep herder, a doctor, some fishermen, a philosopher, a preacher, some prophets, a statesman, a kings, and, and a rabbi. It has a single theme, and altogether Jesus is the answer to all human need. It has two parts, the Old and the New Testament. The Old Testament includes accounts of creation and God's interaction with Israel. And, and these are called the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The Old Testament uh, includes books of history, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. It includes poetry, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. It has prophecy about the coming Messiah and even events leading up to his second coming. The major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, and Ezekiel. It has the minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and my old Italian prophet, Malachi. <laughs> it has all of them. And, and it has a New Testament that tells about the greatest story ever told, Messiah Jesus coming to the earth. It has a New Testament, the, the Gospels that tell the story. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It has a book of history, the book of Acts. It has letters to the church, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon. It has other letters filled with written, filled really with doctrine and instruction like uh, Hebrews and James and Peter, uh, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and Jude. It has a book of prophecy and revelation. No other book has been more scrutinized and argued over, criticized, and loved. It, it is and continues to be the best-selling book of all time. It has transformed lives, it has shaped nations, it has tested kings, and introduced the greatest hope the world has ever known. In spite of being ridiculed, mocked, misused, and manipulated, it has stood the test of time. No other book has been so thoroughly inspected, checked out, and tested like this book that you hold in your hands or a fake Bible that you have on your phone. 
It's been tested. That's good preaching, by the way. That's just, you know, that's just good stuff. Tongue in cheek. And as I said, friends, no matter the latest contemporary translation you may have, it still says that the maker is the creator of all things. And the one who caused the rain to fall, the deep to come up and within the earth and to come out and cause a worldwide flood to destroy the earth, the one who caused such devastation and became worldwide, that overcame worldwide wickedness and destroyed all of mankind except for the one family who was counted worthy to be saved, the same God that destroys is the same God that heals and delivers us today. The God of the flood is also the God of the rainbow. Hebrews chapter 4, the Bible says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the vision of the soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. I hope these words have been encouraging for you today and that we can understand that every time we open this book, every time we read its words, that we are blessed and encouraged by his truth and that we're challenged and convicted. I, I know what it's like to walk through heaviness and darkness of life. Sometimes life and its pressures come and they mount, don't they? Just like a flood. It seems like they're everywhere. But you know what? I, I praise God for the promise of his word. It is during those times that I've been able to trust it, knowing that no matter how that I feel, the Bible says God is greater than my heart and knows all things. And I am blessed by his word because he gives me that promise. I have been through some difficult times, and, and, and lately we've been, I've been through some more personal struggles, and it's always good to sit down with the word and understand that God is speaking to me. And I sit down with my family, and they pray for me, and the family of God that prays for me, encourages me, all because the word has put all this together. It's God's idea about church and family and, and about knowing his word and about knowing him as Savior and, and getting acquainted with the truths of his promises. These are all, this is good stuff. We ought to trust that word. It ought to be in our work. It ought to be in our home. It ought to be in the marketplace. It ought to be in our car. It should especially be in our car. During rush hour traffic, it needs to be in our car. <laughs> Praise God for that. Amen. When you're facing the test of life, trust the word. The word says that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us and gave his life for us. The word says that his word comes to us in our darkest night and it causes us to see the goodness and fullness of life. His word is never, it never ends, it never fails, it, it, it never ceases. And, and if there's anybody that says anything else to you that says it's different, don't listen to them. In fact, Paul told the church in Galatia, he told them, he said, Paul an apostle, not of men, neither by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead unto the churches which are in Galatia. Grace be to you and peace from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Then he rebuked them. He said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you to the grace of Christ and to another gospel, which is not another. But there will be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, should preach any other gospel unto you, let him be accursed. As I said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel than which I have preached unto you, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I would not be a servant of Jesus Christ. Amen. He rebukes them, and he tells them later in Galatians chapter 3, Dear idiots of Galatia. How come you're removed from the word, the spirit of God that led you to the word so quickly because the worries of life and everybody's pressure comes around you and says, hey, listen to me, listen to me. And the television says, listen to me, listen to me. And we get soaked into the next Netflix binge and we forget to spend our time with Christ. And all of a sudden we have become world soaked and we, when, when the Netflix is over, we, we're on the next binge because we can't find any satisfaction. And God says, hey, my word is enough. It is enough. Good stuff. Stand with me, Woody. Would you? I like the uh, Paul. Would just have Paul come this morning and just play for us. But um, you know, Paul again he expresses to the young pastor. He tells him, "Study to show yourself approved to God, a workman unashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth." That our studying is not for personal gain or glory to, or to be praised by men, but it's so that we can be overcomers. 
so that we can trust the word and what it says more than the words of the world. How many know there's a lot of words in the world? I mean, I pulled up a stoplight the other day and <laughs> the words coming out were just foul. They were like, what in the world was that? There's words all around us. We have words from people in our workplaces and, and they say foul things or in our homes and they, they tear us down. And friends, the word of God is faithful. It, it lifts us up and it, it rebukes us, but it lifts us up and it gives us encouragement and hope. We need to trust it because it's always true. It is the source of truth. Jesus, I want to take time this morning to thank you for your word first and foremost that it can be trusted and that we can use it for life and for living and teaching and correcting and that your Holy Spirit has brought us to this moment this morning where maybe in this room, in this place, there have been some who have, who have not trusted your word. We've put it on the back burner and life has become a mess. And we recognize today, God, that we must return again to that word. We must return again to that place of finding you because you are the most important. So we praise you for that. Move in this place, I 